So guys, why are you here? I'm not asking why you exist. I'm asking why you're right here right now in a worship service at Capital City Christian Church. Why are you here? And you might be wondering the same about now. Do you want to be here? Or would you rather not? You're dragged here by somebody? Dragged here by guilt maybe? Habit? Obligation? Fear? You know, maybe there really is a God and a heaven and a hell. All that. Maybe you felt a nudge from God. God does that. Or maybe because you have heard that the pastors here are exceptionally suave and debonair. We get that a lot. Chances are you drove by other churches to get here this morning. So why'd you stop here at Capital City? If you go to churchfinder.com and punch in Frankfort, Kentucky, you're going to find a plethora of options. They list about 85 different churches right here in the Frankfort area. About 24 different denominations all these different kinds of churches, African, Methodist, Episcopal, Anglican, Apostolic, Assemblies of God, Church of Christ, Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, CMA, Disciples, Episcopal, Lutheran, Nazarene, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, a boatload of Baptists, Methodists, Wesleyan, others, different worship styles, different preaching styles, different agendas sometimes. So why Capital City? And you don't even have to leave the house to kind of go to church, right? There's TV church, internet church, and they are way more slick than we are. Professional musicians, professional tech teams, Hollywood quality cameras and operators, Broadway quality lights and sound, research teams to support their world-class communicators. They're really, really good. So why Capital City Christian? I know God wants you in church. I mean, church was God's idea, right? Right? One of the great church fathers put it like this. Now, I know this is a paraphrase, but he said basically, if the church ain't your mama, God ain't your daddy. And I think he was right. But it doesn't have to be capital city, because we're weird, right? I know every church is kind of weird to outsiders, but sometimes when outsiders look at churches, they see churches kind of poking at each other. And sometimes it's not just a friendly competition. Sometimes it devolves into downright hostility. Sometimes churches vilify, exclude, mock, and condemn each other. In fact, sometimes instead of offering an alternative to people in our polarized world, it seems we're like just like them. We're just as polarizing. It's kind of who we are right now as a culture, right? I mean, we're divided into all these camps as a culture. And we just don't like each other. Republicans versus Democrats. We're practically a war. It's almost like it would be evil to agree on anything. LGBTQ, transgender issues. More and more people are dissing the church for convictions that many of us have. And more and more churches are being torn apart from within. Out there, people are coming to blows over the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Out there, we're fighting over immigration. We're fighting over education. What books belong in the school library? What rights do parents have to shape the schools? Public schools versus charter schools versus private schools versus home schools, school choice. People are just getting worked up. Have you been following any of the school controversies over in Lawrenceburg? How about DEI, BLM? There are people out there demanding reparations and tearing down statues for those who have been historically marginalized? I had thought that we'd made progress on racism in America, but I think that maybe now it's worse than any time I can remember. We're still fighting abortion wars. In fact, since Roe v. Wade was overturned, it's almost like it's gotten worse. People out there are fired up over climate change, environmental policies, pushing what for the other side seem irrationally radical solutions. Some of us are fired up about government overspending, taxes, inflation, debt. It's a war zone. And did you know that there are people on both sides of nearly every one of these issues in this room, side by side, kind of? So how can people who are so hostile out there be so civil in here? That's weird, isn't it? What's even weirder is that the people in this room also have serious disagreements over God's stuff. Bible, church. 
We not only disagree with each other on politics, sex and gender, immigration, education, climate change, the role of government and all that stuff. We have profound disagreements over things like creation versus evolution. We've got young earth, six-day creationists in the room and others who think that God sparked a big bang about 14 billion years ago and used evolution to craft all of this. And those sides can get pretty heated. We have profound disagreements over the Bible, things like inerrancy and which Bible to use. We have profound disagreements over the role of women in the church and in the church. Profound disagreements over Calvinism versus free will, things like predestination, eternal security. We have even more profound disagreements over worship styles. What kind of music is appropriate, how loud it should be, the use of theatric lights and fog, whether the worship team can wear yoga pants and go barefoot on stage. And of course, there are always disagreements over things like baptism and eschatology, which is a big word for when and how Jesus is going to come back. Spiritual gifts, I mean, Christians actually still speak in tongues and stuff like that. And the disputatious among us even fight over things like Christmas trees and Easter bunnies. The deal is, for way too many Jesus followers, what we disagree about seems to be more important than what we agree on. And that's awful. And too often, even in church, we exclude and vilify and mock and condemn each other, which is terrible. You see, our culture has accepted two lies, and these lies have infected the church. We think they're lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone, you must hate them or fear them. It's a lie. The other one is that loving someone requires that you approve of what they say or do. Both of these are nonsense. You do not have to compromise your convictions to love someone. And it is possible to pursue both truth and grace just like Jesus did. Truth with grace. Guys, as angry and polarized as people are out there, if the church is doing its go- job, we're going to take hits. Because the worse it looks out there, the weirder it's going to look in here. Now, we have used this descriptor before because it kind of fits the kind of church we want to be. Here it is. We believe this. We welcome those who are single, married, divorced, gay, filthy rich, black and proud, e no habla inglés. I can't have a hard time saying it, right? We welcome those who are newborns, poor as dirt, skinny as a rail. You're welcome here if you're just browsing, just woke up or just got out of jail. We don't care if you're more Catholic than the Pope or haven't been in church since your baby's dedication. We welcome those who could lose a few pounds, thank God, who think the church is flat, worked too hard, can't spell, or came because grandma's in town and wanted to go to church. We welcome those who could use a prayer right now, are three times divorced, had religion shoved down their throat as a kid, or got lost in traffic and wound up here by mistake. We welcome those who are in recovery, still addicted. If you blew all your offering money at Keeneland, you're welcome here. We welcome tourists, seekers, doubters, bleeding hearts. And we welcome you. Welcome. And if you want, we could add these. We welcome Republicans and Democrats and those who despise them both. We welcome those struggling with a plethora of sexual issues. We welcome those with an arsenal in their basement and those who think they're crazy. We think welcome those who want stronger borders and those who think illegal is a dirty word. We welcome Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter shirts. We welcome those who are obsessed with recycling and conserving and those who don't give a rip. They're all here, guys. They're all in the room right now. You're sitting by them. You hug them. You just shared the Lord's Supper with them. Isn't that weird? And the church has always been that way. How cool is that? Do you understand why? So for some reason, you end up at Capital City Christian Church. Some of you have come from other Christian churches, and you're thinking, this Christian church is kind of weird. And some of you guys come from other kinds of churches, and for a lot of you, this place is really weird. Some of you guys don't come from any church at all, and you're wondering, is every church this weird? And I suppose, in their own way, most are. But we do do some things a little differently here. We're not trying to be different. We're just trying to be on mission. 
I sit up here on a stool, khakis and a sweater, no tie. Ben wanders more, but he's always wearing jeans and some stupid longhorn sweater, right? <laughs> Our worship team comes up here, usually in jeans. We've got these little tables around the room with tiny little crackers and cups with this tiny little spot of juice. And every single week we line up for this meal when you could barely qualify it as a snack. Even if you grew up in church, you probably didn't do it like this. We have a tub of water over there. Periodically, we dunk people who want to become Jesus followers. We're going to do that in the next service, which is odd, right? And usually it's a parent or a friend or a neighbor doing the baptizing instead of one of us clergy guys, which is a little different. Our music is a little loud for some of you who grew up on church music. We have these lights and this fog machine trying to immerse you in a multi-sensory worship experience. I'll bet they didn't do it that way in your grandma's church. We avoid churchy words as much as we can, which is different. We use several different Bible translations, avoiding the ones that sound all Bible-like. We have a group of men, only men, who serve as elders of this church family, which is offensive in our culture, isn't it? Did you know that none of this is by accident. When you look at this church family, you can't see them right now because it's dark in the room, but when you look around, the lights come on. What a weird bunch of people. An odd collection of misfits clinging to each other, kind of like a family. Kind of like your biological family, I bet. But we are not a family biologically. But we have people in this spiritual family who disagree with each other on almost every single issue polarizing people out there. And you multiply that with the fact that there are all these profound theological differences between people sitting in this room, sometimes even more polarizing. But listen, it's not that controversial issues don't matter. They do. It's that there is something that matters infinitely more. Do you understand that? See, guys, we believe that God meant it to be this way from the very beginning. This is what God meant for His church to look like. Let me show you two really weird verses. They were weird in that world. They are weird in ours. The Apostle Paul said, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, those were the kind of polarizations that caused wars back then, but not in the church. The message translates it like this. In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among your, you, us, you are all equal. That is, we're all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how. In another place, the Apostle Paul put it like this. He said, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave, free. Christ is what matters. And he lives in us all. Now, do you buy that? Do you really? Are you willing to try to live it out? Because guys, we're going to try. We call Capital City a Christian church, Capital City Christian Church. What's it mean? Shotville Christian Church, Peaks Mill Christian Church, Southland Christian Church in Lexington, Southeast Christian Church in Louisville. Our particular brand of Christian church, believe it or not, was born on the American frontier in the early 1800s. You know why? Because some of the Christians back then got tired of the bickering and the fighting between churches. Presbyterian versus Anglican versus Baptist versus Lutheran. There's an old joke, Emo Phillips, great joke. Some of you have probably heard it before. I'm going to tell it again because it's still funny and it fits. Here it is. I was walking across a bridge one day and I saw a man standing on the edge about to jump off. So I ran over to him and I said, stop, don't. Well, why shouldn't I? I said, well, there's so much to live for. Like what? Well, are you religious or are you atheist? He said, I'm religious. I said, me too. Are you Christian or are you Buddhist? I'm Christian. Well, me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? He said, I'm Protestant. I said, me too. Are you Methodist or Baptist? He said, I'm Baptist. Wow, me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? He said, Baptist Church of God. I said, me too. Are you Original Baptist Church of God or Reformed Baptist Church of God? 
You said, I'm Reformed Baptist Church of God. I said, me too. Are you Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879, or Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? You said, Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915. I said, die, heretic scum, and I pushed him. <laughs> Jesus followers can get like that sometimes. One of the founders of the Christian churches was an old guy named Alexander Campbell, and he was an old light anti burger seceder Presbyterian. Those are all splinters of churches in Scotland. He was on the American frontier. One guy put it, he was part of a splinter, of a split, of a division, of a denomination from Scotland. And they were still fighting those divisions in the American frontier thousands of miles away. And he said, and others agreed with him, enough is enough. What if we just call ourselves Christians? What if we just call our churches Christian churches? Nothing more. It's not that we claim to be the only Christians. We're not. We know that. It's just that we want to be Christians only. So someone asks, what denomination is Capital City Christian Church? Well, we're Christian. I know. What, what kind of Christian? Just Christian. Can't that be enough? Isn't there something that unites us that is bigger than all of the squabbles that divide us? And we're part of that tradition, part of that movement. So here's what it means. We are a Christian church, which means that we are a church of Christ, a church belonging to Christ. This is His church, not mine. His church, not yours. The Bible says Christ is the head of the church. It's His body, which means He's our boss. It means we have no authority to change the message. We have no authority to alter how He says to do business. We have no authority to modify the membership requirements. We have no authority to modify His mission for the church. It's His church. We are not a democracy. This is not my church to lead where I want it to go. This is not your church. It's not the elders' church to shape by their preferences. It's a Christian church, a church of Christ, Christ-centered, Christ-owned. So some people are going to think we're pretty narrow here at Capital City Christian Church. You're going to hear us say things like, you can't choose your own path to God. Jesus is the way to God. He is the way, the truth, the life, and no one gets to the Father without going through Him. They're going to call us narrow and bigoted. And we're going to hold to that because it's His church. And it's because what, it's what He said makes a difference in how we choose to conduct our business. We will not be ruled by our traditions. We will not be ruled by the preferences of a few. We will not be ruled by the preferences of the many. Because it's His church, His mission, His purposes. You agree? So we're a Christian church, a church of Christ, and we are a New Testament church. This book is more than just an inspiring book to us. This is His house, and we want to build it on the principles and guidelines of the New Testament, which is our covenant with God. That means we will not teach anything that we believe is contrary to the New Testament. We will not do church in a way that violates the principles of our covenant with God. It's our guidebook for what we preach and teach. It's our guidebook for how we govern ourselves. So you'll hear me say sometimes something like this. We're going to do it God's way when we understand Him and when we don't. We're going to do it God's way when we agree with Him and when we don't. You know why? Because He's God. So when the New Testament sets a clear path, we're going to try to follow it as faithful as we can. We're a Christian church, we're a New Testament church, and because of that, we want to be a restoration church. We are a part of what many people call the restoration movement, which means as much as possible, we're going to try to follow patterns of the New Testament. We don't have a denominational headquarters. Do you know why? Because they didn't have denominations in the New Testament. You're either a Christian or you weren't. We like it that way. We don't have a district superintendent, a regional minister, a bishop, or a pope, someone out there who governs what we do here, because they didn't do it that way in the New Testament. We're governed by a group of elders that you select, men who are supposed to be sensitive to his leading, not yours, because they're going to answer ultimately to God. That's scary. 
We do it that way because that looks like the way they did it in the New Testament church. We used to have guys and ladies here that we called deacons. We stopped calling them deacons because people misunderstood what that meant. The reason is that in most churches, deacons don't deke the way they deked in the New Testament. Because deaconing isn't about going to board meetings and voting. It's about doing ministry. In fact, that's literally what deacon means, a servant or a minister, someone who oversees ministry. So we have deacons here. Steve Smith is our worship minister, our worship deacon. Ben Webb is our connections minister, our connections deacon. I'm serving as our growth deacon. Aaron and Jess and Derek are our next-gen deacons. Alethea is our communications deacon. Because in the New Testament time, a deacon simply meant minister, a person who governed ministries in the church. We've got them. And because we're a restoration church, we try to do the sacraments, Lord's Supper and Baptism, kind of the way they did it. It's kind of weird. We celebrate the Lord's Supper every worship service. A lot of churches don't. And we are not trying to say they do it wrong, that their worship is unacceptable. But in the early church, every week, the Lord's Supper brought their focus back to first things because this is all about a God who bled for us and died for us and rose for us and who tells us to feed on Him. So every week we have this special mystical meal with our God because that seems to be the way they did it back then. And because we're a restoration church, we immerse people. We dunk them. We baptize them who want to be Jesus followers. We don't baptize babies. We don't sprinkle because that doesn't seem to be the way they did it in the New Testament church. They baptized believers by immersion. And we don't just let clergy guys do the baptizing. You know why? Because in the New Testament, any Christian could baptize someone who wanted to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. So we try to do it that way. So we're a Christian church, a New Testament church, a restoration church, and we are a church that believes passionately in unity. It's huge to us. We want to be a weird, weird place that is bound together by something that's way bigger than those things that separate us. We hate the fact that churches spend more time and energy fighting each other than our real enemy. We hate the fact that so many times Christians inside churches spend more time wrangling with each other than on mission for God. The divisiveness of the church leads to spiritual impotence. Did you know that Jesus actually prayed for this church, Capital City Christian Church? Jesus said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, the 12, but I'm praying for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's us. He's praying for us. And here's what he prayed. I said, I pray that they will be one, just like you, Father, and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I'm in you. And here's why. May they be one in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Because when we spend our energy fighting each other, the world goes to hell. So we're a unity movement. But it is not unity at all costs. There's a fifth and last piece. We believe that in essentials, essentials, there has to be unity. In non-essentials, there must be freedom, liberty. And in all things, there has to be love. 100% truth and 100% grace, no compromising either. You see, guys, a God-honoring unity is not built by pretending something doesn't matter. Pretending it doesn't matter what you believe or what you do. Some people are just kind of, let's all get along, it doesn't matter. Real unity is grounded on the fact that people bend their knees together to Jesus. Real unity comes when people surrender together to Jesus. That's the core, the non-negotiable. We surrender together to Jesus. In the non-essentials, we give each other a break. You do not have to be like me to be a Christian, thank God. You don't have to dress like me, vote like me, think like me to be a Christian. You don't have to like what I like, listen to what I listen to, or do what I do to be a Christian. But in the essentials, we're surrendered together to Jesus as Lord. In the non-essentials, we're free, and in everything we love, powerfully, passionately, and unconditionally. That's what we want to be, a Christian church, a New Testament church, 
a restoration church in pursuit of unity, but never at the expense of God's truth. You like that? Guys, this really is a weird place. It is crazy to think that Cowboys and Packers fans work together side by side. <laughs> Joe Teasley. I almost wanted to kick him out of the church. <laughs> but we love Jesus more. It's crazy to think that Republicans baptize Democrats here. Not to change their political views, but because we know that there is something infinitely bigger. It's crazy to look around and see Hatfields and McCoys praising God together in this room. They've got different names now, but they're here. What do you think? Is this the kind of church that's interesting to you? Is it worth a shot? You don't have to buy it all yet to be a part of us. You're welcome to dip the toe in the water. You don't have to believe everything we believe or clean up your act before you try to do life with us here to explore life with God, for God, God's way together. We're glad you're here. We're glad most of you are here anyway. God certainly is.